Dear friends out there in the Zoom galaxy, I welcome you to the opening of our Illinois Interactive Conference, put together for all of us by SCBWI volunteers. My name is Lisa Bierman, and I'm alongside the very clever, very prolific Suzanne Slade. Welcome to the Crystal Kite Gala, our grand opening for a fall conference like no other. We hope you will learn a lot, laugh a little, or a lot, and have your inspiration kicked into high gear this weekend. In a few moments, you'll get a chance to see our own Sarah Aronson accept the Crystal Kite Award. SCBWI members around the Midwest voted her book, just like Rube Goldberg, to be the winner. But before that, we'd like to give tribute to some other Illinois colleagues by introducing you to their new books. Now, it's a tough time to launch a book. You can't do a signing, you can't do a school visit, you can't do a lot of things. But a right, the right book at a time like this can be a great friend. All of these Crystal Kite Gala featured books and many others will be available in our new SCBWI Illinois online bookstore. Look for the hashtag Read Local Illinois Crystal Kite Gala featured books on this link. Let's begin with new picture books. First up is Me and Mama, written by, and illustrated by Cosby Cabrera. It's a gorgeously illustrated title written in lyrical prose, which celebrates the precious bond between mother and daughter as the two share a rainy day together. And check out this clever, timely book on an important topic, Baby Loves Political Science Democracy by Ruth Spiro. It introduces young pre-readers to political science with its simple, accurate text as it shares what it means to participate in a democracy where everyone has a voice in electing their leaders. Here's a darling debut picture book called You Be Mommy from author Carla Clark. And here's a snippet from this rhyming title. Mommy's too tired to be mommy tonight. Can you be mommy and hold me tight? Carla understands that every mom on the planet no, every mom in the universe knows that feeling, just too tired for parenting. Here comes a new picture book by Alan Havis and Alice McGinty. The sea knows is drenched in rich, vibrant color. Dive in and explore the wonders of the ocean and its inhabitants in this lyrical, fact-filled ode to the sea. Suzanne, did you know there is actually a National Underwear Day? Really? Yep, August 5th, for real. Author Lisa Katzenberger brings us National Regular Average Ordinary Day. Her main character, Peter, decides to celebrate a different holiday each day. Then he starts making up his own holidays. What do you do on National Squirrel Appreciation Day, I wonder? I don't know. I read the book. <laughs> Next, we'll introduce some nonfiction titles from Illinois. So, I know our theme is space, y'all. And here's a book that has blasted off for real. A Computer Called Catherine by Suzanne Slade. Yeah, this Suzanne Slade. <laughs> Her book received a starred review from Kirkus, a place on the NSTA Best STEM Books list, and numerous other awards. Her book celebrates Katherine Johnson, who worked for NASA and helped put American astronauts on the moon. So guess who probably never dreamed of space travel? The pilgrims. Right, but for them, I'll bet crossing the ocean was just as adventurous. In Mayflower, the ship that started a nation, kids can learn about its perilous journey and what happened when the ship finally dropped anchor in Cape Cod. Congratulations to author Rebecca Siegel, whose beautifully illustrated book marked the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower's voyage. Here's a truly inspirational book, I'm a Saint in the Making by Lisa M. Hendy. Her new book shares stories of well-known and newer saints as it helps remind readers how to live with mission and love. Now for a high-flying tale, author Amy Alsnauer brings us flying paintings the Joe Brothers, A Story of Revolution and Art. This biography introduces two brothers who began painting side by side on the same canvas in the 1970s 
and became famous artists. The Zhou brothers also created the illustrations for the book. Next up, looking fabulous, is Joy Michael Ellison's picture book biography about Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson. Sylvia and Marsha met as homeless transgender girls of color. Sylvia and Marsha Starts a Revolution is a picture book for children, their parents, and any trans person who didn't get to see themselves reflected in children's literature. Find out how they sparked the modern LGBTQ movement. Now, let's say you want to curl up for a while with a novel. Here we go. You know, you can have a spectacular adventure without ever leaving Earth's atmosphere. Just pick up this book and head for ancient Egypt. Aria Jones and the Guardian's Wedja by Milena Evans is the second book in her trilogy. And if reading about ancient magic, evil generals, and giant crocodiles sounds fun, then this is the book for you. Kira Graff's new title is The Tiny Mansion, which Kirkus Reviews describes as a hilarious mashup of off-the-grid minimalism and smart home consumerism that adds up to a quirky treat. 12-year-old Dagmar has to spend her summer living off the grid in a tiny house with her family, in the middle of a forest, with a tech billionaire for a neighbor. Then a wildfire threatens everyone's home, whether massive or tiny. Now, if it's a blast off of action you're looking for, mm -hmm. the right book just might be the third installment of Liesl Shirtlift's Time Castaways trilogy. In this new title, The Forbidden Lock, the Hudson kids must find a way to defeat Captain Vincent once and for all. Kate Hannigan's second book in the League of Secret Heroes trilogy is here in all its comic book inspired glory. Akiko, May, and Josie are the Infinity Trinity, kids who crack codes and spy on spies in San Francisco. But what would a kid do if they saw their mom with a suspected spy? Investigate, of course. 11 year old Rini is committed to dancing a solo for her retiring ballet teacher's final recital. But she fears the spotlight and her body is changing in ways she can't control. Her friends convince her that a diet will boost her self-confidence, but instead the diet wreaks havoc with Rini's life. Carol Granick's new book, Rini's Turn, examines peer pressure and finding your own hidden strengths. A Song for Robin explores how it feels as a child to witness racism for the first time. Amanda Kavarzasi has created a powerful historical fiction book set in the 1950s. Her character, Robin, sees someone she's known all her life commit an act of racism, leaving her confused and trying to make sense of it all. If you're looking for an intriguing paranormal romance, then check out Damned When I Didn't by Sherry Collier. In this YA, Avery, an 18-year-old virgin, fights to fulfill her otherworldly duties without losing her innocence. Up next, Lorelei Saverin's debut novel, The Circus of Stolen Dreams. Described as inventive and deliciously creepy, this book shares how Andrea deals with the disappearance of her brother and then pays a high price to enter the magical dream world called Reverie. Now, Lisa, what would you do if you felt the world was going to end tomorrow? Mm, I'd probably double down on donuts, but I bet that's not where you're going with this. That's the question that haunts the main character, Amina, in Michelle Falkoff's new book, How to Pack for the End of the World, a timely story for a generation of young activists. And that is a mighty nice list of options, if I do say so. I say so, too. So glad we agree. And now I'm going to say something completely different. I'm going to welcome Christopher Chang, virtually, of course. Chris has been around SCBWI and the children's literature world for many years. He is co-chair of SCBWI's International Advisory Board. He's the author of many fiction and non-fiction books. And he is the person who established the Crystal Kite Award in the first place. Besides that, he hails from the faraway city, Sydney, Australia, which is an excellent reason he isn't here with us. But he's out there in the Zoom universe, and so won't you devote your attention to the very classy Christopher Chang. 
Hello, Illinois. Well, this is such a delight, such a thrill, and such a joy for me to be here. Well, there, with you guys, virtually. Yes, I'm sort of there. I actually know Illinois. I have been there a few times. I used to work at Purdue, so I do know where you are. I'm here in Australia, of course, and, well, I've got a special job to do. As most many of you probably know, years ago when I was co-regional advisor for Australia and New Zealand, before I went onto the board, I came up with this idea for an award by our members for our members. So I, it was going to be another form of kites, another kites award. And we presented it. It was really fantastic. The voting went well and it was great fun. Of course, Lynn saw it and she said, oh, that's really wonderful. Let's take it global. So within a year, it went from just being for Australia and New Zealand to the whole of the membership. I'm so buzzed by that. And that ended up, my little thing that I thought of, thought of for Australia and New Zealand ended up becoming the Crystal Kite Awards. And it is great. I am so thrilled. And I love looking at them every year and seeing the books and seeing who gets nominated and checking the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful books that our membership all around the world, the power books that our membership creates. So that's where it started out of this strange brain up here. And, you know, it's gone really well. But then, of course, a couple of weeks ago, your wonderful RA sent me an email and said, would you like to? And I said, of course I would. So here I am with you guys, virtually, there in Illinois, and for the, for the Illinois Interactive. And my job, well, it's to introduce the awards, to tell you a little bit about the awards, and then to say, congratulations. But a question, how do you become a successful award-winning author and SCBWI member winning the Divisional Crystal Kite Award? Well, you'll have to ask your winner, Sarah Aronson, for her book, Just like Rube Goldberg. So Sarah, here's the award. Congratulations. What a super book. Of course, this is not a trick question. Okay, folks, congratulations. Sarah, well done. I hope you all have a fantastic conference and thanks for having me there. Bye. Dear friends, thank you for this amazing honor. Thank you to Lynn Oliver, Steve Muser, Sarah Baker, and Christopher Chang for their leadership and imagination, and in this case, for creating an award for and from our community. I'll be honest, I am not usually the kind of person who wins things. Although as a young girl, I stood many times in front of the mirror, empty Coke bottle in my hand, reciting my thank yous. I was first and foremost a big dreamer because up until today, the only things I can remember winning was one, a game of negative bingo, where I was the last person in the room to even have one square filled in. There was also a song contest that I came in second out of two. Congratulations to all who released a book in 2019, a year that seems so long ago Special thanks to the other finalists in our region, Pat Zietlow Miller, Teresa Robeson, and Suzanne Slade. Your books are wonderful, and I hope that everyone listening and celebrating today will check out your sites and find all your stories that you are creating. 20 years ago, when I took the dare to write, SCBWI was the first place that welcomed me. It was where I found my first critique group, my early conversations and conferences, my first teaching and organizing responsibilities that have been such an important part of my writing life. SCBWI has given me more friends than I will ever be able to name today. 
If you are a new writer watching this, you should know that whatever you want to be, your journey starts here with community. The door is open. Please come on in. I also want to thank Illinois Regional Advisor, Debbie Topolsky. I hope everyone knows that without Debbie, nothing happens. This woman works day and night for all of us. She often sets aside her own stories and her own art to help you find the resources to make yours better. Debbie, I share this moment with you. Friends, since you have given me this opportunity and honor, I'd like to say a little bit about this wildly ambitious life that we have chosen. This drive to create books for young readers and teens. This willingness to sit down and make something out of literally nothing. I am so incredibly grateful for this writing life, for the chance to imagine and reimagine and delete and then imagine and reimagine all over again. Sometimes for years, do you hear what I'm saying? We have come to stories for many reasons and with many points of view and many experiences. But for all of us, it is not easy work. That's because it's personal. It's who we are. As a community, we are united in our mission to create all kinds of books for all kinds of readers. We are welcoming. We care deeply about our readers. Our readers, young readers, teen readers, they read to answer questions, to figure out their place in the world. Some are looking for ideas, some for directions. Some want the truth. Others want to get as far away from this world as possible. Story has never been more important than it is now. Hope has never been more essential. Since we first heard about COVID-19, our hearts have been stretched and torn and broken in so many ways. We've been distracted, we've been scared, we've been alone. We have lost much of what I thought I needed to be a good writer. But in losing what I thought I needed, I found more about what the process takes. Somehow, without the library, without coffee shops, and in-person get-togethers, we have continued to write and paint and draw and create and connect. We have found new ways to strengthen our community. In grappling with the fear of this pandemic, we have set aside other fears about putting words on the page. Now, every day, we continue to take chances to reach out of our comfort zones to find new ways to share stories. In fact, in some ways, we are bolder than we've ever been before. Many of you have already heard me speak about the challenge I gave myself when I found my career, oh, I'm gonna say at a standstill. When I look back to that time in 2014, it wasn't rejection that was getting me down. It was self-doubt, the emphasis on the end game, the market. I had stopped enjoying my writing. I called that challenge the power of play. My goal was to take six months and do nothing but write for fun without expectations to be as kind to myself as I was to other writers. I put away my tools and stopped thinking so much. Instead of worrying about what the book was going to look like, I embraced process, passion, inspiration, and intuition. During those six months, I drafted just like Rube Goldberg. I also embraced my true self and my authorial voice. And with each day since, I have continued to find that joy in the work and I've continued to make it stronger. Friends, 
I know I don't have to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. Process is the point. The destination is the journey. Especially now, we must celebrate everything, even the days when the word count is small, where the word count is not at all, where it's negative. We must foster and celebrate curiosity and creativity. We must harness the joy from the work. As I have learned, you, my friends, have never been far away. Your support helped. Your confidence helped. Your belief that I could do it meant so much to me. Our community has helped me feel safe, feeling safe. To imagine has given me confidence. Confidence has made me reach so hard and so far that I almost lose my balance. The book feels out of reach. But even when it feels like I'll never get there, when I fall down, when it doesn't work, I have now learned to get up. Because I know that when we think outside the box, really, when we rip that box open and tear it to shreds and forget it ever existed, we focus on curiosity, then we are succeeding. When I first began researching Rube Goldberg, I felt drawn to the contraptions, to my own childhood love of the breakfast machine from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. It was a magical connection that was all about me and my dad and all the magic in the world. I respected Rube's complicated and political humor, as well as the statements about the world he made clear in his art. What kept me going? I felt connected to his journey. Indeed, in this book, I have said what I've always wanted to say. I'm very proud of that. In a way, those complicated paths were just like mine. Ideas are gifts. I will never turn one down. In writing this book, I was able to speak to my ideas about work, determination, creativity, and empower others to think that way too. Lately, it's been interesting. Readers have been asking me about one particular page. The 1906 earthquake in San Francisco crumbled the city and left many people without jobs and homes. In the wake of disaster, it can be hard for people to focus on their dreams. It can be even harder to feel hopeful. But Rube didn't give up on his dream. Instead, he did the only thing he could do. He kept on creating. He kept on trying, even when he faced failure, even when it wasn't easy. And so must we. Just like Rube Goldberg, we must embrace our passions. We must speak our truths. We must never stop trying. And we must have a great time along the way. As my first editor told me, Deborah Brody, eat dessert first. There are so many people I need to thank and honor. First to my editor, Alan Johnston, and her team at Beach Lane Books. Thank you for the genius decision to give my text to Robert Newbecker, whose art made my words come to life, and honestly, it still makes me cry. I love my book. Thank you to my agent, Sarah Davies, who rides this roller coaster with me and cheers me on. Sarah, I know I don't make it easy, but I am grateful that you are here for it all. I couldn't do it without you. To every single writer that I have worked with at Highlights, at Writers.com, and at SCBWI conferences, thank you for trusting me with your stories. Thank you for your willingness to take suggestions from me. Let me tell you, it is a lot easier writing a letter than what I ask you to do to finish your books. And there is nothing better than when I get, pick up the phone and get great news from you. Thank you for trying everything. 
You have all inspired me to search and reach and enjoy the work more. To the Vermont College of Fine Arts and all the places I have learned along the way, I am so lucky to have worked with so many great people like Kathy Appelt and Carolyn Komen, the late Norma Fox Mazur, Rita Williams Garcia, Cynthia Lydic Smith, and my retreat co-organizer for 14 years, Cynthia Fonin. Thank you to my friends, Nikki Grimes, Jane Yolen, Heidi Stemple, Corey McCarthy, Meg Wiviet, the Melanies, both Fishbait and Crowder. Gratitude to my Saturday morning Chicago alumni group. You have given me more love and more laughs and more tears than I will ever be able to return. Thank you to my amazing supportive critique group for always pushing me forward. That's Carolyn Crimmy, Laura Ruby, Jenny Meyerhoff, and Brenda Ferber. To my family at Highlights, to Kent, George, Allison, Amanda, Dan, Christine, Joe, and everyone else who knows me as the mother hen, who helps me make the magic happen for so many writers and illustrators. Thank you to our amazing reading community, especially the Windy City readers, as well as my friends at my local independent bookstores, the Bookstall and Booked. Thank you to all the educators and librarians who have brought me to your classrooms and chatted with me at conferences, to my friends at Scholastic Book Fair, and everyone involved in Kids Need Mentors. To my dearest friends, who I now call family, to Tanya Lee Stone, whose daily phone calls I could not write without. I mean, it only took me, what, 15 years before I dared to write nonfiction? To Ellie Swartz, who brings positivity and light to every conversation. To Kelly Carter Crocker, who has put up with me in more ways than any friend should. To Nancy, Jennifer, Crystal, Nicole, Rob, and Melissa, Elisa, and Ashley, there is no one I would rather hang out and talk craft with in the middle of the woods. Also, no one else could have gotten me to watch Xanadu or find my own sparkle in a story about fairy godmothers. Last, my amazing family. I grew up in a family of educators and scotch drinkers. Professors, rabbis, musicians, dancers, and actual legitimate geniuses. Someone had to be a writer. Too much material and so much love. To my mom and dad, my father is a man who could keep a room of 600 students awake and laughing and talking about economics at 8 in the morning. My mom wrote plays and poems for us to perform. She showed me that story was a medium for connection and hope. To my sisters, Miriam and Annie, there will never be enough sister time. To my kids, Rebecca and Elliot and Ed and Liz, I love you all so much. I am trying so hard not to cry. To my husband, Michael, the person who makes this life possible, you are the best decision I ever made. I love our adventure together. I love you so much. Sylvie, Alice, and Emmett, my next book is called Brand New Bubby, and it was inspired by you. When I got stuck, all I had to do was close my eyes and imagine reading books to you, which I will do as much as all of you would like. Last, dear writers, artists, friends, and readers, we all have things we do when we are looking for inspiration. One of the things I remember is something Lori Hulse Anderson told me. She said, we didn't choose this life just to write stories. We chose this life to make this world better. It is why this award means so much to me. I truly believe that we can all follow our dreams, embrace our passions, and just like Rube Goldberg showed me, we can enjoy every second. There is room for everyone. 
You are where you should be. When we work together, we all learn. We all win. Thank you so much.